PVL 3701 Study Unit 1 Number 1 Introduction Although this module is termed the law of property, it actually deals with the law of things in a narrow sense. In its broad sense, property law can also be described as patrimonial law, the law dealing with a person's patrimony, all his or her assets. Patrimonial law is divided into the law of things, the law of succession, the law of obligations and intellectual property law. Patrimonial law regulates all rights of which the objects are assets in a person's estate. In this broad sense, everything that forms part of a person's estate can be described as property. Property therefore includes a variety of assets, such as things, for example, land, a car, a computer and a mobile phone. Also personal rights, the creditor's rights or claims, for example, the right to one's salary, the right to the proceeds of an insurance policy or the right to claim the purchase price in terms of a contract of sale. And also immaterial property rights, for example, copyright and patent rights. The law of things as a subdivision of patrimonial law falls under private law. The law of things deals with a specific legal object, namely a thing. To refresh your memory on the position of the law of things in the bigger legal picture, take a close look at the following diagram. Please study the, the diagram in your own time. To sum up, in a broad sense, the word property in the law of property refers to everything that forms part of a person's estate. In a narrow sense, and for the purposes of this module, property law refers to the law of things, which is the system of legal rules that regulates legal relationships between legal subjects in regard to a particular legal object, namely a thing. The definition for of law of things Therefore, the law of things can be defined as a branch of private law, which consists of a number of legal rules that determine the nature, content, vesting, protection, transfer and termination of various real relationships between a legal subject and a thing, as well as the rights and duties ensuing from these relationships. Study Unit 1 Number 2 Definitions in the law of persons, you have already encountered some of the definitions discussed below. We repeat these definitions here to refresh your memory and because a clear understanding of these definitions is indispensable for a study of the law of things. 2.1. A legal subject. A legal subject can be defined as any person, whether a natural or legal person, capable of acting as a subject in legal relationships and of acquiring rights and incurring duties in the process. Human beings, natural persons, are the most common and best known legal subjects. But legal persons such as the state, universities, companies, closed corporations and so on are also legal subjects. Since they can act as legal subjects in a legal relationship and can therefore acquire rights and duties. 2.2 Legal object. A legal object can be defined as every object with which a legal subject has a legally recognized relationship. These legal objects may be divided into things, performances, immaterial property and personality property. Each of these legal objects has its own characteristics which can distinguish it from other legal objects. The rights and duties established by legal subjects in re legal relationships pertain to one or more of the various kinds of legal object. The law of things is concerned primarily with rights to things, although other rights may be discussed as well. In the law of things, the distinction between things and performances as legal objects is very important since it determines the Equally important distinction between real rights and personal rights, creditors' rights and claims. In the law of things, 
We are therefore concerned primarily with a specific legal object, a thing, and the legal relationships pertaining to it. 2.2.1 Thing Generally, a thing is a legal object, characterized by its material or corporeal nature. For a complete picture of a thing in a legal sense, we define a thing as an independent part of the corporeal world world, which is external to humans and subject to human control as well as useful and valuable to humans. In the next section, we discuss these characteristics in more detail. 2.3. Law, right, real relationships, real rights and entitlements. 2.3.1. Law and right. We have already referred to the law above without defining it since we assume that you know the meaning of the term. To refresh your memory, we define the law as that body of rules and norms which regulate and harmonize a society by demarcating the rights and duties of legal subjects. One must furthermore distinguish between the law and a right. Rights deal with the lawful relationships between legal subjects and the relationship between legal subjects and the object of their rights. 2.3.2 Real Relationships and Real Rights A legal relationship is a relationship to which the law attaches consequences, where the object of a legal relationship between legal subjects is a thing, we refer to a real relationship. A real relationship is the particular legal relationship between one or more legal subjects and a thing. This relationship has certain implications for the legal order. Note furthermore that the concept real relationship is broader than the concept real right, since real relationships include both real rights and certain unlawful real relationships. There are usually two sides to a real relationship, and therefore it is a lawful real relationship to a real right, namely, first, the subject-object relationship between the particular legal subject and the particular thing involved in the relationship, and secondly, the subject-subject relationship between the particular legal subject and all other legal subjects. A real right is therefore always a deal relationship. The subject-object or thing relationship and the subject-subject relationship. In certain cases, real relationships may take on distinctive characteristics, with the result that the things and duties ensuing from these relationships may vary. We therefore distinguish between different kinds of real relationships on the basis of the ensuing rights and duties. In principle, a legal subject may acquire rights from a real relationship only if it is lawful, that is, if it complies with the legal rules. A legal subject will not acquire any rights from unlawful real relationships, although the, the relationship as such may still have consequences for the law of things, as would be the case with the real relationship between a thief and the thing he or she has stolen, as you will see in study unit 9 below on possession and holdership. The nature, content and consequences of a particular real relationship in a specific situation may be influenced by the attitude of the legal subjects concerned, by the nature of the thing as well as by a variety of surrounding circumstances. The most important real relationships are usually divided into three categories. First, ownership, which is always a lawful, a lawful real relationship and therefore a real right. Secondly, possession, physical control of a thing with the intention of an owner, animo domini, which is always unlawful and is therefore only a real relationship, not a real right. Thirdly, holdership, physical control of a thing with the intention to derive a benefit, which may be lawful or unlawful. When it is lawful, it could give rise to a real right. You can study the diagram on your own time. Okay. Possession and holdership can be subdivided, in turn, into the various real relationships, which may be lawful or unlawful. 
in good faith or bad faith. The establishment, nature, content, protection and termination of each of these relationships are governed by the rules of the law of things. The right which, which has its origin in a lawful real relationship is known as a real right. Only lawful real relationships, namely ownership and lawful holdership, confer real rights. Possession and unlawful holdership, on the other hand, are unlawful real relationships, which do not confer any real right. Although the law attaches certain consequences to such relationships. Therefore, a real right can be defined as a lawful real relationship between a legal subject and a thing which confers direct control over the thing over the thing on the legal subject, as well as the relationship between the legal subject and all other legal subjects who must respect this relationship. The object of a lawful relationship this determines the nature of a right. Apart from real rights, we also recognize personal rights creditors' rights or claims, immaterial property rights and personality rights. This module deals almost exclusively with real rights, but we also refer to personal rights. The distinction between the two is very important in property law, and we discuss this aspect in study unit 2 below. The difference bef between the four classes of rights is illustrated by the following diagram. Categories of rights. Object is thing, performance, personality, immaterial property of the right. It is real rights, personal rights, personality rights, and immaterial property rights. And the example, ownership, right to purchase price, right to a good name, and copyright. Okay, but you can really just study that on your own. Um, 2.3.2.1 Entitlement A legal subject who acquires a real right from a lawful real relationship is usually entitled by the legal order to perform certain acts in connection with the thing. For example, first, an owner may sell the thing. Secondly, a servitude holder may use the thing. Or third, a pledgee may hold the thing as security. The capacities conferred on the legal subject by virtue of a right, in this case a real right, are called entitlements. The term entitlement therefore refers to the content of a right. The entitlement of a real right determines which acts <coughs> a legal subject is entitled to perform in regard to a thing. In the case of a real right of ownership, the most important entitlements are the legal subject's entitlements to First, control. Second, use and enjoyment. Third, burden. In cumber with limited real rights such as servitudes or real security rights. Or fourth, enjoy the fruits. Fifth, consume. Six, alienate, sell and deliver. And seven, vindicate. Claim from whoever is unlawfully in control of the thing. The various legal rules governing the establishment and exercise of these entitlements all form part of the law of things. 2.4 Remedies When the law recognizes a particular real relationship or a particular real right, enforcement takes place by means of a specific real remedy. A real remedy can be defined as a legal process with its own purpose, for which certain requirements are set and which protects, maintains or restores a particular real relationship in a specific way. A real remedy therefore finds application in lawful and unlawful relationships. Various remedies are used in the law of things to fulfill different functions. First, in the case of real rights, remedies serve to maintain, protect or restore the real rights concerned. But, secondly, there are also remedies governing the legal consequences of unlawful real relationships, 
For example, the spoliation uh, remedy. See study unit 9 on the protection of possession and holdership. Study unit 1, 3. Function of L law of things. The function of the law of things can be summarized as follows. First, it strives to harmonize or regulate various competing ownership rights, especially between neighboring owners. Secondly, it strives to harmonize or regulate an owner's rights in regard to his or her thing, with the rights of other limited real right holders to the same thing. And thirdly, it controls the acquisition, protection and extinction of things and real rights. Study Unit 1, Number 4, Bases and Sources of the Law of Things. It is generally accepted that the modern law of things in, Southern Af in South Africa and the concept of ownership in particular are derived directly from lo Roman law and still bear many similarities to it. This view should be approached with circumspection. Since the socio-economic and cultural environment in which a particular legal system functions exerts an important influence on the nature, content and application of legal principles and institutions in that system. The classical Roman law of the first three centuries AD developed and was applied in an environment that differed radically from the modern Western and particularly, particularly the African environment. It would therefore be misleading to assume that specific legal principles in the two systems should be exactly the same. It is true, historically, that the modern law of things is the end product of a long and complex development which had its origins in classical Roman law. However, it is equally true that this system underwent drastic changes in the more than 20 centuries of its existence. Therefore, many characteristics of the modern law of things are the products of our, of our time and of the circumstances to which it applies. The sources of the modern law of things are therefore to be found not only in the historic writings of Romanists since the classical Roman period and the works of the Roman Dutch writers, but also in statute law, legislation and in case law. Since its adoption, the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa in 1996 has played a major role in the development of the law in general, and in particular in the development of the law of things. Furthermore, customary law greatly influences various aspects of the law. The sources of the modern law of things can therefore be summarized as follows in order of priority. First, the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, the 1996 edition. <laughs> uh, secondly, statute law, legislation. Thirdly, case law. Fourthly, common law, or the Roman Dutch law, or indigenous customary law. It should be noted that in a multi multicultural society such as South Africa, indigenous law, rather than Roman Dutch law, may be the system the subsidiary legal system in certain instances. Study Unit 1, Part B, Number 1 Definition In the above section, we distinguish between a legal object and a thing. A thing may be defined as a legal object, which is an independent, independent part of the corporal world, is external to humans, subject to human control, and is useful and valuable to humans. These are therefore the characteristics of a thing or the elements of the definition of a thing. In the following section, we discuss each of these elements separately. 1.1 Elements of Definition 1.1.1 Corporeality It is generally accepted that the law of things is confined to, a thing, to things that form part of the corporal world and are therefore perceptible by means of the senses, for example, land, a car, a brick, or a horse. Two specific problems are created by this requirement. First, there is a Roman Dutch law tradition according to which certain real rights are defined in such a way that the object of the right need not be a corporal thing. 
but may be another rite, which is then described as an incorporal thing. Although this tradition is undesirable, logically and systematically speaking, it is well established and works in practice. We can, however, deal with the institutions where an incorporal thing is the object of a right as exceptions. The most important exception is a pledge of claims. See the case of the National Bank of SA Limited versus Cohen's Trustee in 1911 and Mulman N.O. versus Twiggs in 1995. In principle, however, we, can, we shall confine the concept of a thing to a corporal thing. Secondly, technolo technological developments have given rise to such questions as whether a natural process such as electrical or atomic energy can or should be regarded as a thing. Such a question may arise in various contexts and would determine, for example, whether something like electricity can be stolen and whether an electricity supply internet service or telephone service may be subject to spoliation. spoliation. We can see this in the case of Telcom SA Limited versus Exonate Proprietary Limited in 2003. See study unit 9 on the protection of possession and holdership. 1.1.2 External to Humans it is accepted in modern law on the basis of religious and ethical considerations underlying the legal system that the human body and parts thereof cannot be regarded as legal objects. An object can therefore qualify as a thing only if it, if it is not part of the human body. In future, this issue may give rise to considerable debate owing to the advancement of medical technology and the shortage of human body parts for transplants. A distinction should be drawn between human tissue parts, which can easily be separated from the body and replen replenishes itself, for example hair, blood, semen and ova on the one hand, and body parts, parts which can be separated, but where separation may be harmful, for example kidneys and lungs. The first category is significant at present because of its implication for the provision of human procreation cells in the growing industry made possible by artificial procreation. In the second category, we are dealing with the need for human body parts for organ transplant purposes. In both these categories, we have objects belonging to a living person in mind. The question, therefore, is whether the law should allow people to deal with parts of their bodies. Dealing with and in these objects are regulated by the National Health Act 61 of 2003. Objects deriving from the human body which can no longer be related to the person concerned because he or she is brain dead also pose a problem. Here two issues should be distinguished. The one is whether the person gave his or her consent to such an organ donation before his or her death and the other is whether the payment can be levied by their relatives. Although corpses or parts of corpses may re be regarded as things, they fall outside the legal sphere, extra commercium, and are therefore not subject to private ownership. 1.1.3 Independence. The independence of a thing denotes that it can function as a legal object for the purposes of the law of things, only if it has its own individual existence and can be recognized as a demarcated distinct entity. The requirement that a thing must be capable of existing inter independently is the result of the Roman Dutch view that two persons cannot simultaneously be the owners of different aspects of the same thing. This poses certain problems. First, in most cases, interdependent individual things, for example a pen or a book, do not create any problems. But composite things, like a car or a bicycle, are made of made up of several parts and can this lead to problems. It is therefore necessary to distinguish between principal things, 
accessory things and auxiliary things in order to apply the principle of inter independence so as to obviate the problems surrounding the ownership of composite things. Secondly, with certain kinds of things, the requirement of an independent existence gives rise to specific problems because some things, for example, water, sand or gases, are not naturally, naturally delimited into recognizable units, but are only collected into independent units by human intervention. For example, by collecting the water, sand or gas in a container such as a bottle, a paper bag or a cylinder, respectively. Only with such human intervention can seawater or fresh air be said to be an independent thing. Thirdly, in certain cases, the characteristics of independence or indiv individuality has been adapted by new developments in the law of things. One example is that of ownership in sectional title units. The sectional title owner establishes a right of ownership in a unit which comprises a section of a building and a share in the communal part of the building and the land on which the building stands. Co-ownership. See section 1 of the Sectional Titles Act 95 of 1986. This, the concept thing, has been adapted statutorily and to accommodate the independence principle. The sectional title unit can therefore be regarded as an independent thing on the basis of its statutory definition. See study unit 15 paragraph 2. The same considerations are relevant in the demarcation of pieces of land on which individual owners establish their rights of ownership. The earth is not a thing as such and land may be subject to real rights only when separate pieces of land have been surveyed and demarcated into separate units. See the Land Survey Act 8 of 1997. 1.1.4 Subject to human control. Objects can be significant for the law of things only if they have the potential to be legally controlled by humans. It would be absurd at this stage for any person or group of persons to claim control over the planet, Mars, for example, and therefore it cannot be considered a thing. Nor is it possible to control objects, objects such as air or seawater, which have not be yet been divided into individual controllable units by human intervention. Only when it is really possible for humans to bring a certain object under their control in such a way that a legal relationship may be said to exist between the legal subject and the object can the object be regarded as a thing. 1.1.5 Useful and valuable to humans The law is only concerned with real relationships when these have legal consequences. This is the case only when a thing is useful or valuable to a legal subject. The legal relationship between a homeowner and a grain of sand in his or her garden has no legal consequences. In principle, and the grain of sand would not be considered a thing. A heap or load of sand, on the other hand, could have value and would therefore be regarded as a thing. Value need not demote denote economic or market value with a price attached to it, but simply that the legal subject wants his or her relationship with the thing to be maintained by the law against interference by other legal subjects. Whether the law would regard a specific thing as being of value to humans would, would depend largely on the circumstances and would, determine, would be determined objectively. The legal maxim de minimis non curat lex, the law does not concern itself with trivialities, is an important consideration here. An old family photograph, for example, may have sentimental value, which would be sufficient for it to qualify as a thing. Study Unit 1, Part B, Number 2 Classification of Things 2.1 Criteria for classification. 
the practical infinite number of object, objects which may be defined as things can be divided into different categories that are significant for various aspects of the law of things. We classify things in various ways, according to different criteria. All things may be classified according to either of two major criteria, namely, firstly, the relation to humans, and secondly, the inherent nature of the thing concerned. 2.1.1. Relation to humans. When things are classified according to this criterion, the nature of the thing is not considered, but only the function or purpose of the thing in various legal processes and transactions. Here we distinguish between negotiable and non-negotiable things. 2.1.1.1 Negotiability The negotiability of a thing can influence its function radically, and classification of things according to this criterion is therefore important. In principle, all things are negotiable. Res in commercio, things which are in the legal sphere or in commerce or trade. The following things are excluded from commerce, res extra commercium, and are therefore not negotiable. First, res communis omnium, things that do not fall under private legal control but that are available to be used by all legal subjects, for example, free air and things that are really only susceptible of human control by communal use. Secondly, Res publicae, things that belong to the state but that are used for the general benefit and use of the public, for example, national parks, the seashore, and so on. Thirdly, other res extra commercium, things that are not freely negotiable for other reasons, for example, body parts or a corpse for religious or ethical reasons, a corpse and parts of a corpse are not regarded as things. The Roman law category of things belonging to the gods, res divini urius, is no longer recognized in modern law. But the question has been raised whether the land on which family graves are situated should not be regarded as being outside commerce. Negotiable things, res in commercio, may be either someone's property, res alicius, or no one's property, res nullius. In the, other, in the latter instance, anyone can claim ownership of them by means of appropriation. We therefore distinguish between first, res alicius, alicius things belonging to an owner and forming part of his or her estate, or secondly, res nullius, things that are susceptible of ownership but that belong to no one at a particular stage, for example, wild animals or fish, or a thing that has been thrown away by its owners who no longer intends to be the owner. Res relicte. 2.1.2. The inherent nature. In this criterion, when this criterion is used to categorize things, things are classified not according to their relation to man, but according to their inherent characteristics or qualities. Various classifications are possible on this basis. 2.1.2.1 Singular and composite things Things may be singular or composite depending on whether the thing consists of a single piece or of a composition of constituent parts. A horse, a stone or a brick are examples of singular things. A composite thing is made of, of constituent parts or even of independent things that have been joined together to form a new identity, for example, a car or a bicycle. Here the constituent parts lose their individuality and the composite thing is regarded as one thing for the purpose of the law of things. A collection of things must be distinguished from composite things. Two forms of collections are relevant. In the one we deal with a collection of similar principal things and in the other the collection consists of different types of principal things. 
In both cases, the collection is treated as a singular unit. Here we distinguish between, first, a, collect a collection of similar things. For example, a flock of sheep, a swarm of bees, or, a stock of, or the stock of a shop may be treated as a unit by the law. And that unit is then a composite thing for the purposes of the law, although the members or parts of the collection do not lose their individuality. It is important to remember that such a collection is only regarded as a unit for certain purposes. The owner owes, owns both the stock or swarm or stock and the individual sheep or bees or items in the stock. Secondly, a collection of dissimilar things. Things such as corporal and incorporal things or things and rights, for example, in a, an entire estate. Such a collection would be treated by the law as a legal unit, but then only for specific purposes. This would be the case in insolvency law and in the law of succession, where the insolvent estate and the deceased estate respectively are regarded as independent entities. A composite thing usually consists of various constituent parts. In principle, we distinguish between three kinds of constituent parts. The, firstly, the principal thing is the independent thing made up of various parts, with an independent existence as a composite thing. It is not a constituent or supplementary part of another thing. A car is an example of a principal thing. In composite form, land is always regarded as a principal thing, not the buildings attached to it. Secondly, an accessory thing can have a separate existence apart from the composite thing, but has forfeited its independent existence in that it has been physically joined to the principal thing, for example, a brick cemented into a wall. And thirdly, an auxiliary thing can, like an accessory thing, have an independent existence apart from the composite thing. However, if for, it forfeits its independent existence without being phys physically joined to the principal thing. The, auxili the auxiliary thing is economically dependent on the principal thing. We can see this in the case of Senegal versus Ruet in 1983. A key is a good example of an auxiliary thing, since it, it loses its independent character in that its economic value in terms of its purpose and use depends on the unity between the principal thing, the lock, and the key. Without the, the lock, the key is not functional. Okay, um, fruits. Fruits from a separate class of things, for example, apples on the tree, natural fruits, or the interest of investments, civil fruits. As long as a fruit is attached to a principal thing, it is accessory to the principal thing. However, at various stages and for various reasons, it has to be distinguished from the principal thing to which it relates. Fruits denote the income or yield regularly produced by the principal things, thing, while the principal thing itself is preserved. In principle, fruits are accessory things and as such constitute part of the principal thing. But with this difference, fruits are in intended to be separated from the principal thing so as to have an independent existence. We distinguish between natural fruits, fructus naturalis, for example, wool, fruit or milk, and civil fruits, fructus civilis, or non-organic yield, for example, interest on capital or rent payments. In the case of natural fruits, further distinctions can be made between hanging fruits, fructus pendentis, separated fruits, fructus separati and gathered fruit, fructus percepti. The rights to see these fruits will vary according to the relevant legal relationship involved. 2.1.2.2 Movable and Immovable Things 
Another classification, according to the nature of things, is that of movable and immovable things. In principle, immovable things consist of land and everything that is permanently attached to land, including natural attachments like plants and artificial fixtures like buildings and structures that are permanently attached to land. Movable things are things that can be moved from one place to another without being damaged or losing their identity. For example, a choir, a car, a shirt, and money. Movable things are things that can be moved from one place to another without being damaged or lose, losing their identity. For example, a chair, a car, a shirt, and money. <laughs> this distinction... I think they double printed that. But in any case, um, this distinction has significance in several fields of law. First, it affects the form formalities and requirements for the transfer of ownership. Transfer of ownership of movables is affected by delivery and of immovables by registration in the deeds registry. Second, several statute statutes distinguish between movable and immovable things. For example, the Deeds Registries Act 47 of 1937 and the Alienation of Land Act 68 of 1981. Third, private international law distinguishes between movable and immovable things in that the law of the owner's domicile, Lex Loci Domicili, applies in the case of movables. Whereas the law of the immovable things location governs immovables lex loci re sede. We can see this in the case of Southern Tankers Proprietary Limited TA Unilog versus Berskana Dioro Limited in 2003. Sorry, my pronunciation on that is probably way off. <laughs> okay, fourth, the right to alienate or encumber the estate of a minor is affected as follows. Permission of the High Court is required for the alienation or encumbrance of a minor's immovable assets with more than a million rand. Five, in the execution of a judgment debt and in the case of insolvency, the debtor's movable assets are sold before their immovables to secure payment of the judgment debt. 6. In criminal law, theft can be committed only in respect of, of, of movables, while arson can only be committed in relation to immovables. Real security is affected by means of a pledge in the case of movables and by means of a mortgage in the case of immovable things. 2.1.2.3 <clears throat> Fungible and non-fungible things. Things are fungible, replaceable, res fungibilis, or non-fungible, irreplaceable, res non-fungibilis. This distinction <laughs> depends on whether they have individual characteristics or value or whether they belong to a certain kind or genus. The individual character of a kilogram or sugar a kilogram of sugar or a liter of water is negligible and they can therefore be replaced by a kilogram of the same kind of sugar or by another liter of water. However, an original Picasso painting cannot simply be replaced by an original Smith painting. This distinction is significant in various areas of law. First, in the law of obligations. The replaceability or otherwise of a specific thing is determined by agreement between the parties and may affect the consequences of the agreement. For example, if X buys the rice or the race horse lightning and the seller delivers the farm horse lazy boy, <laughs> The seller has not performed in terms of the agreement. However, if X buys a horse, the seller can deliver any horse. Secondly, pledge. A fungible cannot in principle be given 
in pledge with the intention that it can be replaced by a similar thing. It is a basic rule of law of basic pledge that the pledgee may not use the pledged article. Third, transfer of ownership. In certain circumstances, a fungible may change ownership by means of commixtio, mixing of solids or confusio, mingling of liquids. Okay. Number four, replacement. It would seem that the courts are more inclined to authorize the repair and even the replacement of a damaged or destroyed fungible thing in a spoilation order. In certain cases, then would be the case of non-fungibles. 2.1.2.4 Consumable and non-consumable things Consumable things, res consumptibles, are used up, consumed, or their value is consider considerably diminished by ordinary use. For example, penals, pencils, foodstuff, and cigarettes. Non-consumable things, res non-consumptibles, are preserved in spite of normal use. For example, a motor car or a stove. A thing can be non-consumable despite the fact that it is subject to normal wear and tear. This distinction has significance in more than one instance. First, loan, lease and usufruct. With reference to consumable things, the borrower's leases or usufructory's duty to maintain is duty is really a duty to replace. Secondly, ownership. A person who uses a consumable thing becomes the owner by means of consumption. Third, money. Money is regarded as a consumable. 2.1.2.5 Divisible and indivisible things. A thing is divisible if it can be divided without losing its essential characteristics into smaller parts of which the nature and function are essentially the same as those of the original thing. Examples are a bag of sugar, a roll of fabric or piece of land. Indivisible things such as a car or a painting cannot be divided without destroying or changing the nature of the thing.